Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, when we look at the SDGs, the SDGs represent, and they, all, they also tend to demand a lot of change. They demand a lot of change to happen over the next 15 years, 14 years, um, in order for the SDGs to be achieved. And then we look at SDG 17, partnerships. So change will not happen without partnerships. That's clear. And I'll, I'll bring my guests up now, the panelists. You can come up and sit down. And what I want to do is, is really to start to discuss not only this change that happens, not only the partnerships that's required, but how partnerships have to change. Partnerships have been historically unbalanced, public sector, private sector, the way that the civil um, sector, whether it's UN, NGOs. So we have to bring this balance back up. There's got to be a new partnership architecture on how we want to bring this together. And yesterday, yesterday was a great day. There's a lot of great uh, information and everything that came out yesterday. Uh, what I want to do is I want to bring up some challenges. I want to get some of the harder questions to be asked. We'll do a quick introduction. We've got a few questions. We'll start the dialogue. And then we'll hand over to the audience towards the end for about the last 15 minutes. But don't be afraid to ask the hard questions. There are a lot of hard questions that have to be asked. And these types of forums actually are an invitation to bring some of these bigger issues out. And because there are a lot of challenges as we go forward. So I'll let each of the panelists introduce themselves very quickly and then we'll get into uh, some of the discussions. Please, Dave. Uh, my name is uh, Dave Harmon. I'm Vice President for Global Public Affairs for Huawei Technologies Company. Uh, Huawei as a company is uh, one of the largest uh, telecom solutions provider, uh, providers in the world. We provide telecom solutions to leading telco companies. We sell consumer products and we uh, provide uh, uh, solutions to industries and to uh, governments uh, alike. Thanks, David. David, good morning, good morning. everyone. Uh, my name is Lucita Jasmine. I'm the Director for Sustainability and External Affairs of the April Group. April is the second largest pulp and paper manufacturing company and is also a plantation forestry company that is committed to sustainable forest management. I'm Steve Oaken. I'm the head of public affairs for KKR in Asia Pacific based here in Singapore. KKR is a global investment firm. We have over a hundred billion dollars in assets under management and, and with that um, money we invest uh, in companies We've got uh, invested in more than 80 companies across the world, employ more than uh, a million people. Uh, within Asia, we have about uh, just under 40 companies that we've invested in. Uh, from no, uh, for those of you from Indonesia, Gojek is, is an example of the type of company that, that we invest behind. For Provincias, I work for DSM. DSM is a life science, material science company. That means that we are a supplier to the automotive industry, to the food industry, to the electronics industry. So we have a variety of customers. A lot of our products end up in your phone, but also in your food. Um, not the same product, by the way. Uh, don't worry. Uh, the, and what we have been doing in the last period, the last decade, is to really look at sustainability as a business growth driver uh, and have been steering our portfolio to come up with all sorts of solutions for large societal challenges. And with that, looking at the topic of today, public-private partnerships are an essential component there. And Malcolm made a quick introduction. My name is David Gallipo. I uh, lead the UNDP Social, um, Social Impact Fund. And when I sit down often, when I'm sitting down at the table with other investors, people are looking at me like going, the UN investing? Like what, really? But yes, I mean, there is change happening. The UN itself has realized that um, change cannot happen without a different type of partnership structure with capital market investors, different type of partnership structure, the way that we can work with also governments and um, investors and how that comes forward. So these are the things that are really happening in change. And the panel is not there by accident. It's really there by design. Life sciences, investors, uh, technology, these are some of the critical areas now that are really going to be the drivers for change as we move forward. So f one of the first questions I really want to ask is, within your own organizations, and personally perhaps, how your approach to going forward, what do you think has to change with partnerships within your own organization, and maybe you have some of your own examples, 
Um, what do you think really has to change? Where the challenges are and where do you think really has to change? And I'll start at the other end. We'll go in reverse. We'll start with Paul first. All right, okay, thank you. Um, one of the important things what I've been sort of experiencing in the last period is understanding. <clears throat> it's extremely important to understand each other. We lost understanding of each other. And understanding, in my definition, in my definition is the ability to look at things from the other perspective. That is extremely critical. We need to be able to see things from a different perspective. We have a partnership with the World Food Program. World Food Program is the largest food aid distributor in the world. DSM is the largest vitamin producer in the world. WFP was providing a lot of food focusing only on calories, so only carrying 25 kilogram bags, making sure that people had to fill an empty stomach. But you see that you keep people alive but they will not thrive. Ch children will not develop to their maximum potential. So what we said in was the challenge, how can we bring our know-how and our products into the equation for WFP um, and be able there to improve the quality of the food that WFP actually provides? And it's actually there we learned important lessons. We learned a lesson of you need to have a shared goal while you continue to have individual responsibility to have a successful partnership. That is very critical. It's a, it worked with WFP. If you would walk into a team meeting, WFP, DSM, you would not be able to tell the difference um, who is from which organization because we have one shared goal. We want to reach people with improved nutrition. Um, that's the goal. But when we walk out there, we all need to do our own homework. The second is, Part of, of success and what we need to redefine is thinking complementary competencies. In the private sector, we are perfectly fine in defining what we need when we look for joint venture partners, when we uh, license technology out, when we license technology in, when we go into any form or shape of partnership. But we seem to have a problem doing the same when we think about public-private partnerships. When we want to reach a certain goal, we just need to look for the complementary competencies that we need to have to be successful. And, and there's a lot of things that governments can do that we cannot do. There's a lot of things that WFP can do. They have the trust, they have the ability to reach people, while we have the know-how. If you bring those complementary competencies together, then you get traction. And the third success item for me is it needs to be truly relevant what you're doing. I see organizations embarking on projects, embarking on partnerships where it is a nice to have, or it is very much around an, a PR or a PA perspective, a public, uh, uh, it's very much around um, how can I short term boost my reputation rather than it makes long term business sense. For us as a company, it makes sense to work on nutrition because in the end it creates a market. It creates endorsement. If WFP said it, says that a solution is good, then of course it carries much more credit than if we would say nutrition is important for you. If I say that, then obviously people will say, yeah, th but it's your business. If WFP says it, that carries an endorsement which we cannot have. So I think that sort of, um, it needs to be truly relevant for the company is an important one. And uh, the final thing, and that's also I think one of the challenges and so far, we have not seen major accidents, but I would urge everybody, both on the public as well as on the private side, is to focus on due diligence. Really investigate upfront who are you teaming up with. It is important for credibility. It's also important for success to do a very thorough due diligence before you engage in partnerships. So due diligence, risk mi mitigation, understanding risk appetites and these types of things. But that's where the challenge comes in because often the languages don't balance. People have different perceptions of what risk is and it's interesting. And as uh, we'll, we'll go on to Steve now from the investment side and everything else, I'm sure that's a part of that too. Steve, please. Yeah, so core to, to KKR as an investor is ESG. Right, so ESG is environmental social governance. Every business in the world, every organization in the world has, has ESG uh, impacts. You know, how do you uh, manufacture goods, what uh, type of emissions do you exist? That would fit in the e-bucket. How do you treat your workers? How do you treat the communities in which you live? That fits into that S or, or social bucket. And then G on governance is, you know, how is your company run? Is it transparent? And so understanding ESG 
And as an investor looking at ESG, both in the pre-investment phase, when you do your due diligence, and looking at ESG from a risk and an opportunity perspective is, is critical, and we do that. And then, how do you work with companies in the post-investment phase, um, after we've invested in the companies and we partner with them, to make them more sustainable from both uh, an ESG perspective and a profit perspective? Because if you're going to really change the world from a business perspective and make a difference, you're going to do so at a profit. If you're not in business and making a profit, it's not gonna work. So the, the question is, how do you integrate both? How do you make companies more profitable and more sustainable at the same time? And the way to do that is to have a better understanding of the world. There are so many changes going on in the world right now. Um, you know, in economics, you often talk about you know, bear markets and, and bull markets. Are the markets going down or are the markets going up? Well, in, in politics today and, and for the past few years and for the foreseeable future, we only have a bull market in politics. You just have to look at, at the recent elections in the UK and the US and in the Philippines to see that, that things are changing all the time. And there's so many dynamics changing with them. It, it's because of environmental concerns. It's because of what's happening with demographic challenges. It's, what's be, it's because of what's happening with a 24-7 news cycle and social media. All of those things are changing. And for us to be investors, to be the best investors, to make a profit, we have to understand the world better. And we use partnerships to help us do that. And this is where partnerships come into play. So we have a, a longstanding partnership with the Environmental Defense Fund. And we work with EDF to figure out how can we make our companies more sustainable. So they teach us and through their teaching us, we can apply that to our portfolio companies. We work with BSR, Business for Social Responsibility. How do we understand supply chains better? How can we be more, it, more efficient in our supply chains, but more import, importantly, more sustainable in our supply chains? Because that makes us better investors, and it makes our businesses better if they have ethical supply chains. So that's, that's really the approach we take from investment thesis through due diligence, through the operating phase, and, and how we work in partnership to try and make us better investors. You know, it's, it sounds interesting. When we talk about change, change doesn't always move in the same direction. So as we start to see businesses become more responsible, looking at ESG metrics and these types of things, we're also starting to see populist governments come in, nationalist, domestic, with a focus on um, domestic economic growth. And also just this change in responsible business, perhaps we need to see responsible shareholders and index funds, because they're the ones sort of driving the businesses on one side too. So it's interesting how, from the investor standpoint, which is basically the blood of the economy, how that's gonna have a large impact on the rest of development and economy. Please, Mr. Um, thank you, David. Um, you would all be aware that prior to the SDGs, many of the companies in our sector, the forestry sector, have actually been already making voluntary commitments to support sustainable development. Many have made no deforestation pledges or the promotion of sustainable forest management. But what the SDGs have done is actually to provide this um, red thread that ties all this together into a coherent whole. So we look at the SDGs as a platform that actually um, unifies state and non-state actors towards a common agenda. But for the SDGs to happen, I think I would like to make a case for transformational partnerships. And by this, I mean partnerships that actually make lasting impact and are ambitious in terms of their scale. And I would submit to the audience, to you, that there are three imperatives that need to happen for transformational partnerships to be part of our implementing mechanism. So first is trust building. I think our folk will also touch on this in terms of making a case for understanding. There has got to be a space to allow all the partners to establish mutual trust. And I think uh, Eric Solheim, the new U executive director of the UN Environment Program, mentioned this at lunch yesterday when he spoke. He said, big businesses are not necessarily always the bad guys. We are here at the table, on the podium. We have the will, we have the resources, we have the business case you know, to be part of the solution to make SDGs happen. Um, the second point I'd like to make is about UN adaptability. The UN is going to provide leadership to the achievement of the global development agenda. And while the UN have, has already given signals to openness to working specifically with the private sector, there's still a lot that needs to happen within the UN system to really make private sector engagement meaningful for the organizations. 
I worked in the UN for seven years. I realize I am very much aware of the hoops that, uh, that you know, organizations, staff uh, actually need to go through to make private sector engagement happen. You have a comprehensive due diligence system. You have a committee to justify too. You need to have a fully developed project document to back that up. And in some cases, we've even had to actually get clearance from member states. So, you know, for, so for the UN to be able to fully leverage private sector support, then there has got to be some flexibility in terms of UN processes as well. Now, the third point, of course, relates to us as the private sector. You know, what needs to happen with us? What is that change that needs to happen for us to become meaningful partners? And I think there are two fundamental shifts that we need to do. One is we need to embrace the concept of shared value creation. Mm. This means actually expanding our understanding of what actually means to invest in sustainability. I guess an example that I could give is that our company has actually invested $100 million over the next 10 years for conservation and restoration. So, and for us, this is about investing in natural capital and mm. in actually also, of course, protecting, ensuring that the ecosystem services that we need to keep the plantations viable are actually there. But we also do realize that investing in restoration is a long-term game. This is not something that will happen in just in the next five to 10 years. So, and also, of course, we also realize that the benefits, the returns from this investment are not necessarily just for the company. They will all go to the rest of the actors that are represented in the landscape and, of course, for the country as well. The second fundamental shift that needs to happen with companies is that we need to change our long-term strategy for growth. And the way we're doing this in the company is that we've adopted the strategy of decoupling business growth from further resource impact. So what we're doing is basically one, we're investing in science and research to improve the productivity, the yield of the plantation so that we can grow the business even if we don't expand our plantation footprint. And secondly, of course, we're diversifying into uh, high value products and finally we're pursuing certification so that we can get into premium markets. Mm -hmm. So just in summary, I believe we can get to transformational partnerships but there has got to be a trust building process. There has got to be some more openness on the part of UN and its processes and businesses need to embrace shared value creation and a new strategy for growth. Um, stop there. I'm, I'm seeing some of the things that you're talking about. I actually see in the UN now, in the UNDP starting to change now where our philosophy we, even our language, we talk about business models. We talk about agile sort of deployment, sort of um, acting short but thinking long, mm -hmm. and then keeping that flexible so we can always sort of change our targets going forward. But I still see, again, as you said, there's a lot of challenges. It'd be interesting to see the SDGs and that whole communication around the SDGs translated to business language, mm -hmm. translated to a language that actually capital markets and business can understand talking about non-financial returns versus financial returns. And also, again, this balance between the social and the economic um, impact that comes in. And what we're really talking about is integrated reporting. So if corporations can go to an integrated reporting where they report on financial returns as well as their social impact in one sort of standardized format, there's a lot of interesting things coming in, but that, again, that's a challenge. Um, David, please. Uh, well, I'd like to just move back and uh, sort of ask the question, well, why did the Millennium Goals, why were they not implemented to the Let, best let's capability? Let's be clear, I, I asked the question. Yeah, yeah the, the, no, no problem. <laughs> the, uh, why were the Millennium Development Goals not implemented to the best level possible? And there were really two rivers running in tandem, so to speak. On the first hand, multilateral bodies and governments around the world weren't engaging to a strong an extent with the private sector. And then on the other hand, the private sector itself was not engaging enough in engaging in business practices to promote sustainability. So the world leaders met last year in New York. They've agreed the sustainability development goals that have to be implemented between now and 2030. So in my opinion, the two things that have to change is that there has to be a greater uh, enhancement of partnership between the public and private sector because the private sector, because without the involvement of the private sector, the, the objectives uh, of the sustainable development goals will not be implemented in their entirety. And secondly, the private sector must uh, uh, have, uh, must come to a greater realization, some companies are already engaged in this, that there is 
excellent business opportunity from engaging in sustainability. Uh, that, uh, that new business and economic models can grow from this. Uh, in Huawei myself, I deal with international political relations and I've had extensive dealing with multilateral bodies in the last year. And uh, a number of international bodies are putting in place new programs to engage the private sector. The United Nations is there, the World Bank has a new program involved engaging the private sector, the European Commission, the African Union, the United Nations Commission for Science and Technology, uh, the ASEAN Commission. In fact, yesterday I had a meeting in APAC. APAC itself has uh, structures in place to form policy partnerships. Uh, and that really is a positive uh, way forward. Um, in fact, uh, I was interested with the uh, slogan of, uh, on, the, uh, on the advert uh, behind where it referred to the words innovation and collaboration because, in fact, those two words really are vital components to implementing these strategies. Um, uh, innovation doesn't stop at any one defined geographical border. So if you want to innovate and bring new products and services and solutions to the marketplace, uh, you have to collaborate with the best talent where that talent lies. And if you want to tackle key societal problems, whether in the transport or energy or health or social services arena, you have to collaborate and innovate uh, to the best talent possible. Uh, Huawei itself, the company I work with, we do employ uh, 80,000 uh, researchers and scientists. So we are innovating at a, at a high pace. Uh, our chairperson, Madam Sun, is a member of the United Nations Commission uh, to deliver broadband for all. So we are working carefully uh, with uh, other partners from the uh, intergovernmental and research and educational communities. Because the challenge is very real. Uh, according to the United Nations last year, 4.4 billion people in the world still do not have access to high-speed communications, access to broadband. And this is just simply unacceptable. Uh, the digital divide exists in all countries in the world, but sadly exists in more countries to a greater extent than others. So Huawei, in partnership with many other companies and public sector organizations, are bringing forward new solutions, particularly in the field of wireless technology, to help bridge this divide. And we should recall that in 1950, there were only 3 billion people living in the world today, are living in the world at that time. There are 7 billion people living in the world today. In another 30, 35, 40 years' time, there's going to be 9 billion people living in the world today. So uh, uh, we have to ensure that this digital divide is arrested and corrected, uh, and it's not widened in any shape or form. Thanks, David. I'll touch, I'll touch on your first point. From the MDGs, there are a lot of lessons learned. I see reports coming out all the time. The question is, are we learning the lessons? Are we actually learning the lessons and changing internal processes? Are we actually changing our approach um, to how we want to go forward? And that's a key question that I'll come back to each of you individually on. But also the other part where there is a lot of innovation in the world. It's sort of not distributed properly. And one of the main challenges that I'm seeing is that policy is just lagging behind the way that the advances of technology. Science and technology is moving at such a fast pace that policy can't keep up, legislation cannot keep up. And I don't want to say regulation, but certain forms of control just cannot keep up. Privacy comes to, to point on that. So I think there's, there, there's a challenge for those that are driving and who are working very closely with governments to really start picking up the pace and starting to help them understand what has to be in place. By the time they create policy for the next five years, technology will advance 10 to 15, 20 years. And this is going to create more digital divides, going to create more problems. And access to digital is simply access to knowledge. And knowledge is a right that everyone should have. Access to education, access to health, e-gov services, these types of things is very prominent. So I'll come back again. I mean, I'll start with David. David really gave some, no, not David, I'm sorry, Steve. Steve has some great examples about what their organization is doing moving forward. But what do you think? What would be the biggest thing you'd like to see, let's say, five years down the road, 6, 17? The SDG framework is 15 years. What do you think you would like to see within your own organization four or five years down the road that's really going to make a big change? I, I think you've got to start with the point that the way the SDG is going to be most impactful is it's going to be through business. It's going to be through entrepreneurs <laughs> who create these businesses who then can impact and address the challenges in, in the sustainable development goals. And I'll just give two very brief examples. And, and one of those is a company called Sundrop. 
um, and that is based in Australia. And this is the, the first company, I think it may be the first company in the world, this is a company we've, we, we've invested in, that grows crops carbon neutral, fresh water neutral, and pesticide free. So what they do is, is, is they use solar power um, to desalinate seawater. That seawater is then used to, to grow the, the tomatoes. Um, the solar power powers the greenhouses, in this case glass houses, um, so you have no carbon emissions. And they're now growing 15,000 tons of tomatoes a year. So about 15% of all of the, the trust tomatoes, or the tomatoes off the vine, are going to be produced by Sundrop in, in Port Augusta in South Australia. And, and this came about because you had an entrepreneur who came up with the idea. You had an innovative government in the government of South Australia who, who set up the framework so that he could get started down there because you have, this is a greenfield investment. So you have to start with a test facility. And to do that, you're gonna need some government support. When you get there, then you can get an investor like KKR who can come in and bring in the capital so that you can then build a facility that will grow the, the tomatoes that Sundrop's gonna grow. So it, it's, it's, it's recognizing and supporting those entrepreneurs and then having an investor like KKR be able to come behind them, but we've gotta wait till they get beyond that proof of concept mm -hmm. stage. Then there, there's a, a CEO of a company in Indonesia here, Aaron Fishman, who, who's the CEO of East Bali Cashews, who recognized a huge challenge in, in Eastern Bali, which is that you had a lot of agriculture there, but none of the processing took place. It all took place overseas. So he was able to start a business with $180,000 um, to get a cashew processing facility, the first one in Eastern Bali there. He now employs over 400 uh, women who've never had jobs before. Um, he's a very profitable business, and now he's starting to attract the type of, of support that government's bringing. So in this case, business-led government came behind. In, in the Sundrop case, government-led business came behind. And, and it's, it's having an ecosystem where all of those are possible that you're gonna start to really get impact. It sounds like the key to that is really an, a forward-thinking, innovative government that is using to support that. And, and it's, it's that, and then it's an investor approach, because the, the CEO of Sundrop tells a story when he tried to get his $100 million plus investment for Sundrop, he, he, he took the concept to agriculture investors. And the ag investor said, well, this isn't an ag investment. It's a renewables investment because you rely on solar. Ah. And then he went to the renewables investors. And they said, well, this isn't a renewables investment. It's more of an uh, infrastructure investment. So then he went to the infrastructure investors. And they said, well, this is more of an ag investment. And then he came to KKR, and he told us a story. And we said, you're a solutions investment. You're a solution right, to a societal challenge. And we want to invest behind these types of, of companies, getting a market rate of return. And he said, you get what I'm trying to do. And, and so our being investors and changing our mindset and looking at this from an investment thesis perspective is, is also what's going to change, change the way we can hit these SDGs. But it's also a language change. And I see now breaking of the barriers, what used to be, what, what used to be called infrastructure, what used to be called these different types um, of segmentation in the market now is all starting to come to place from a market investment perspective, but also from the partnership investment, where actually governments now are looking at investing, and they see sort of development as an investment, investment in human capital, natural capital, but also an investment in economic growth, so, and business continuity. Sustainability, profitability is often a bad word, but all it means is sustainability. It means that you can grow, and impacts can grow, and development can grow further. You can employ your people longer. So I think there's a lot of changes that have to be made in language and also the way that we have to break down silos. And I know we all say that, but we actually have to start doing it. We actually have to start cross-pollinating some of the ideas. Sinta, please. Um, I, I just want to pick up on your point about the silos. And I think um, it also touches on the discussion earlier about what actually, what were some of the lessons from the MDGs. I think the, the beauty of the SDGs is that you have the 17 goals and for organizations, you know, to, to actually begin working towards the SDGs, the first thing that they do is to find the goal that is most relevant, right? And to, but, but the challenge is actually to just use that as an entry point. Because at the end of the day, no single SDG stands on its own. You actually, you know, every SDG has an impact and a dependency on all 16 others. Mm -hmm. So basically the challenge for organizations who want to support the SDGs is to work their way into establishing interlinkages with the rest of the goals. So like in the case of our company, for example, naturally we'll gravitate towards goal 15, life on land. 
But we all know that, for example, 46% uh, of terrestrial carbon are, is actually stored in forests. So what that means is that whatever we do in goal 15 is necessarily impacting goal 13, you know, climate action. We also know that deforestation is largely a socioeconomic issue. Mm -hmm. So whatever we do in terms of goal one, ending poverty, is also key to achieving goal 15. So the way it translates for us in terms of our SDG strategy is that we need to be holistic. We're not just looking at forests and conservation and restoration. We have to look at innovations on the ground as well. You know, when you speak of innovating, it has to be for us at the grassroots level because we operate in underserved communities. So for us, for example, to stop deforestation, it's about providing livelihood uh, opportunities, alternative economic uh, opportunities for the people at the local level or providing opportunities to burning so that they don't burn and or continue to encroach the natural forest. So I think that the, the key lesson is actually also to have that holistic approach and to understand that you know, every goal or every aspect of this intersects and impacts the other. It sort of brings up this concept of like the value chain, mm -hmm. which used to be sort of supply and distribution of these, but now this value chain, if, if I would ask everyone in the, if there's 500 people in the audience and I ask you to get in your silos, there would be 500 silos. I mean, it, it comes silos. down to that granularity because everybody has a day job. Everyone's got something to do. But if you start to think of what happens before things come to you or what happens when things after what come to you, it's the same with investing. You invest up and down the supply chains, the same when you talk about technology. So I think it's something that we, we, we're gonna have to start looking at, broadening our own perspectives, because, because, the, because change happens at a personal level. You can drive change from organization, you can drive change through financial flows, but really people have to change. And uh, as we get into that, please, David. Indeed, people have to change, but I mean a key element in that process of change is to ensure that strong political leadership is maintained uh, now and in the years ahead in selling the importance of implementing the sustainable development goals. Uh, the world leaders went to New York last year and <coughs> agreed these important objectives. Now it is incumbent upon these world leaders to maintain the momentum that has now commenced to implement the objectives of these goals and this will be a very important uh, objective of the new uh, Secretary General of the United Nations, Guterres, uh, when he uh, assumes office in the early part of uh, next year. Uh, the reality is that uh, to implement the Sustainable Development Goals is going to involve a stronger partnership between the public and private sector. So the private sector, the public sector has to engage mm -hmm. to a stronger extent with the private sector. But equally, the private sector has to engage to a stronger extent with the public sector. Uh, uh, some of the finest officials in the world are working in public organisations and it's to bring the best practices and best ideas from both the public and the private sector together and it's then translating and selling those best practices uh, around the world to, uh, to other governments, to other multilateral bodies, to individual companies, to research organisations and of course to individuals uh, themselves. Uh, but one shouldn't underestimate the importance of investing in research, science and innovation in this process. Uh, if one looks at metrics uh, in terms of how countries are supporting these policies, countries that are investing more heavily in research, innovation and science um, are producing stronger economic returns. Uh, research and science is no longer part of a policy connected to the ICT, information communications technology world. ICT now transcends uh, all key governmental sectors, whether in the field of energy or transport or uh, health. Uh, and again, if one is going to fulfill objectives to support uh, the development of these sectors, such as the digital economy and research, innovation and science, and thus help uh, combat uh, key societal challenges, you need the involvement of the private sector again. I mean, I worked in the European Union before, uh, in the European Commission before I came to work with Huawei two years ago. And the European Union has a target of 3% uh, GDP to be invested in research, innovation and science by 2020. That target again can only be achieved uh, if there is a closer, in, uh, if there is a clear involvement and participation by both the private and public sectors. But that's a, that becomes now a direct challenge to leadership. And leadership and hierarchy, the way that leadership used to work from a top-down, sort of a trickle-down, if you will, sort of effect, where 
that has to change <coughs> because what you have to start doing, and I think folk can speak to this because in, in life science industries like this, leadership is investing in bottom innovation to drive change from the bottom up. And I think that's what sort of thing that has to change, especially in institutions like EC, like the UN and things like that. Foko, please. Yeah, I'd like to build on, on what I heard uh, Steve and uh, Lujita say um, around, we're talking here about scale and we're talking here about impact. That's, I think, very important. Um, we have to be careful that there are too many pilots out there that are not really scalable, mm -hmm. which we should discontinue because mm -hmm. that takes up energy, that takes up resources. We shouldn't do that. We look at things that are scalable. And what we also need to do is really look at impact. The private sector, and it's been said already many times, has an can be an enormous force for good. And how do we create the right incentive structure there to make that, to achieve that scale? If I, if I take SDG 2 around food, the private sector provides close to 100% of what people consume. Um, so if you don't change the offering of the private sector, you don't change anything. Um, it comes all on your plate through a private sector. Even the smallholder farmer is in the end a, sm an, a private sector player. So what we need to do is to really look into how do we reach that scale and building it indeed bottom up, but also using different means. We see, and, and that's a great step forward, all forms of blended finance. We have made an investment in Africa, in, in Rwanda, where we are building a factory and we're opening uh, uh, next week, actually, um, uh, where we are building a factory that will produce a fortified porridge for young children to make sure that kids get the right food when they grow up, because that will determine, in the end, their, the rest of their life. That will make, uh, that, that will, that's the difference between stunted for the rest of your life or having a normal development at, early at an early age. Making that investment, we work there with the government of Rwanda, with donor uh, governments, with um, uh, IFC, CDC, FMO, development banks, and all together we can create, and together with the World Food Programme as, as one of the customers, all together we can create a different way of doing business and achieving big impact. We create uh, uh, stable incomes for 9,000 farmers. We um, reach 1 million children with improved nutrition, um, so change the lives of 1 million children. And we create four, 500 high uh, quality jobs in Rwanda, which in a country like Rwanda is, is a significant amount. So that's the sort of thing by collaborating public-private, by overcoming the hurdles, um, by helping to de-risk it was able, we were able to invest, and the de-risking came here from governments and from the UN, all together creating a system that can be a force for good. And I think that is what we need to do. Um, SDG 17, it's the wrong thing to say that partnerships are a goal, because partnerships are obviously a means and not a goal in itself, but um, uh, SDG 17 is really to stimulate that sort of creativity and innovation, not only tech innovation is important, but business model innovation, that will help us to come to the next level and that will help to bring things to scale. And financial innovation. Blended finance, very, very dear to my heart. Um, but blended financing, and uh, as we saw yesterday, one of the outcomes is the creation um, of, the, of the collective that we put together, the Social Finance Collective in Asia, which actually brings together a bank, a development bank, a UN organization um, and a commercial bank together to sort of do that dialogue. And it sort of creates the enabling space for that dialogue to happen where traditional funders, new capital markets can look at financial innovation to really invest in new types of technology and innovation. Absolutely. And I think there, there is an overrating of we need X trillion uh, and there is a big scare. The SDGs will be way too expensive. If we all start investing differently, by blended finance uh, mechanisms, then the amount of money is not the issue. I'm not that concerned about raising that capital. It will be to drive the economy in a different direction, to make it really a people, planet, profit approach of the economy. And then that way we will get the capital there. I'm not that concerned about that. Mm -hmm. Then the supply and pipeline, that's, that becomes the interesting stuff. So yeah. investable projects. Yeah. I'm gonna do a time check because no one's checking me on time and I've 
And Malcolm said I could actually speak all the way to noon. Um, so we have five um, minutes, I think. Do we have time for Q and A? Okay. Then there's some interesting things coming out. There's some positive, and there are some challenges coming out. But I'll challenge the audience to come up with some questions. Challenge. Here's your chance to ask the tough questions. Whether it comes to the UN, whether it comes to the different sectors and that, ask the tough questions because here's the sort of the forum where you can do that type of stuff. And I don't know who's managing the floor. I see a lot of hands. Okay, questions just went up to five dollars a question. <laughs> Please. I don't know who's got the mic there. Hi everyone, I'm Jackie Good. from Ipo Malaysia. Uh, build, I'm building up an energy company uh, serving the bottom of the pyramid and operating in the Philippines. Uh, as you, we all know, uh, after political change in the UK, followed by the Philippines, and uh, the change in the US president administration imposed a concern uh, to Tesla motor and solar city because of the eliminations and reductions of the solar investment tax credit. And from the investment point of view, um, how does that translate into your due diligence approach and the attractiveness of the companies within those countries. Thank you very much. So basically, how, how are you leveraging political disruption to actually make positive change? Anyone want to take this? I'll take one question at a time. I mean, I mean it, what we try and do as is, is, is a global investor is to look at all of those factors at once. And, and, and you do that both in the investment thesis part and in the due diligence phase. So in an investment thesis part, if, there's a, 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 if, 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 if Brexit is to occur, Right? It hasn't occurred yet, but if Brexit is to occur, then what is that going to mean in terms of, of, of travel? What's it going to mean in terms of financial services? What's it going to mean in terms of, of immigration? And so, that will, so you want to take that into account. And so when we look at investing, we, we take four approaches. We look at the company level. We look at, at the macro level from an, a macroeconomic perspective. We look at it from a political perspective. And then we look at it from a country risk perspective. And, and right now, we're certainly looking at everything differently than we would have looked at it a year ago. But nobody knows what, what's going what's to come in, in the next year or two. So it's certainly that uncertainty is something that does impact how we think before we're going to make our investment. So scenarios, be agile, scenarios. I see you over there. Yeah, you. Mm -hmm. Mic people. Uh, hi there. Uh, excuse me? Hi. Uh, Matthew from uh, Williams Sonoma. We're a home furnishing company based out of the United States. Uh, my question is do you think there is space for um, private private partnerships, even among competitors? Um, is, I mean, is there sustainable partnership models? for that and what platforms are needed to work together towards a shared goal? I think that, um, of course, private-private is what we do a lot of times uh, because that's all the work that uh, Steve is doing um, uh, and that's most of the work that we are doing. So private-private is not the problem. What I do see is a need for pre-competitive working to get things done. That is a very essential one where, of course, in the end, uh, partners will compete for the market. but to help um, reframe markets and help shift markets, we need to, mo to have more pre-competitive uh, collaboration. What you see, for instance, in organizations like the World Business Council for Sustainable Development or the World Economic Forum, where organizations are coming together to together try to help reframe markets. And I think that's an important part that needs to get more attention than what it got so far, also from an anti-competition uh, perspective. Um, just to add to that, I think what we're working towards is really not just public-private partnership, but people-public-private partnership. You know, we, in, the, in the context where we operate, we actually operate in the rural communities. So, so the partnerships that need to happen do not just involve the, the, the bigger public sector representatives, but we need to work with the local communities. And so these are the types of partnerships that actually we feel have an impact on the ground because you actually see the changes that are happening. An example of this is the Farfi Village program that we have. We're working with the communities to, um, uh, towards, uh, well, 
towards fire prevention through community engagement. So we actually work with the villages themselves, and then of course we get the governments. And this time, if you're saying, you know, what about the competitors? Yes, when, with the model that we have, when we found out that it was successful, we actually offered it to the rest of the companies in the forestry and agricultural sector, and this has emerged into a fire-free alliance. So they have adopted that model, and now they're trying to also see mm -hmm. whether it's going to work in their operations. So we have companies like Wilmar Musimas, Sign Darby, who are actually signed on. So yes, there is that, um, there is, uh, I guess, a, a certain form of coalition of the willing that happens also even among competitors, and at the same time, the inclusion of other parties aside from just the government or, you know, or mm -hmm. the private sector. And I'm just, I'm going to come back to Sundrop because here, that's a, it's a great example of, a, of three partnerships among businesses. So KKR partners with Sundrop, but Sundrop can only exist because of its partnership with Kohl's, which is, which is one of the largest you know, supermarket chains in Australia. So Kohl's enters a partnership with Sundrop and they say, we're going to buy 100% of, of the tomatoes you produce. We're going to have a, a, an offtake agreement for everything that you, you produce because that is, going to, that is what's going to drive KKR to invest in, in Sundrop. And then when Sundrop has that partnership with Kohl's, Kohl's can then show how it's supporting sustainability, how it's offering you know, the most sustainable produce possible. So it's a win for Kohl's, it's a win for Sundrop, and then it's a win for KKR. And so it's these three types of businesses coming together in these types of partnerships that can really fuel a lot of, a lot of growth and, and social impact. Yeah, in fact, uh, just one brief point. Uh, Huawei as a company, we operate a number of uh, solar and photovoltaic and recycling centers. And of course, we are, we've put these operations in place together with the private sector. So of course, there's a multiple of opportunity for the private sector to cooperate more with other elements of the private sector concerning these matters. Uh, one more question to the back here, but I think Lucida brings up an interesting point that today's collabora collaborators are tomorrow's competitors. And t today's competitors are tomorrow's collaborators. I mean, things are changing even in the, in the, in, within your own competitive markets. And I think collaboration is the only way that you're going to sustain your sector. One back here, please. Last question. And then we'll wrap up with some final, um, some very quick final points. Thank you. And I hope this is a difficult question because I don't think you've had a difficult question yet. Um, <laughs> I'm Jeanette Gurung. I'm from Women Organizing for Change in Agriculture and Natural Resource Management. I think there's a perspective that's missing here on the panel, and that is of C CSOs and civil society. Mm -hmm. And I think if we're going to talk about social environmental goals, we cannot leave this group out. However, there's a different perspective here. As long as we're talking about businesses, social businesses are able to generate profits through the sales of products and services, we've left out most of those NGOs who don't know how to or are not valuing, their services are not valued in a financial way that investors are ready to invest in. So I think this is a really important point and I think that you need to think about taking non-financial returns on your investments. I think if one answer might be, what if we could get social units or some sort of alternative currency that investors could uh, accept rather than just a payment back in a financial currency, and maybe that's one answer. But otherwise, I think, you know, NGOs are being squeezed out of this new reality, and you don't hear about this very often, but many of us are really struggling just to keep the lights on. So you can talk about partnerships with us, but if we cannot maintain our staff, our offices, our global presence, there's no one to partner with. Thank you. An right. excellent point, and I'll, I'll ask you. I'll, I'll, leave, I'll even point at the organizers around that, even, even, even our own organization, that we have to look at civil society, CSO, as part of the business collective and to sort of encourage how they can actually participate in that, whether it's PSPP models or new models. Um, but uh, an excellent point, and thanks for bringing that up. We're running out of time, so I'm going to give everyone sort of one minute as a closing thing. What's the big thing, the big change, five years down the road, ten years down the road, what would you like to see happen? Um, in this space over the next you know, five, ten years? What's the one big thing? And then we'll close. Please, from this side. Well, to implement the STGs, the key thing is to increase investment in people. And in increasing investment in people, you have to give more educational opportunity. Uh, I mean, yeah, give a man a fish, you can feed him for a day, teach him to fish, you can feed him for life. Human capital, exactly. Uh, for us, it's, uh, the, the one thing that's not been mentioned is basically policy coherence, especially at the national level. 
and of course a balance between regulatory action and incentives uh, for business. Whatever we're doing right now does not necessarily have to be seen in a punitive context. This is something that is forward looking and as we said, we're here, we have the will, we have the commitment, we have the business case and we are ready to act and innovate in support of the SDGs. Please see. In terms of partnerships, it's, it's coming up with uncommon partnerships, un, unthinkable partnerships, because it's, it's those partnerships that are often the most powerful. And if you go back you know, 10, 20 years, you'd have never thought that a private equity firm would partner with the, the Environmental Defense Fund. But that has been an incredibly powerful partnership for both us and for EDF. So what type of partnerships we're trying to think are we not thinking about today that we could implement tomorrow that's going to make us a better investor and that's going to make the NGO or whoever we partner with in civil society more powerful as well? Yeah, for me, it's, it's all about getting the consumer and the citizen on board. I mean, we've seen the elections in the last period and we forgot about a couple of people. Mm -hmm. And it's extremely critical that we get them on board. The consumer needs to come on board because otherwise we do not get a sustainable change in the offering. So that is an important one. But unfortunately, the consumer and the citizen are not the same. So you can ask the citizens uh, what they really want. And then you see you get a lot of answers about green and health. And then we see at the breakfast table piles of calories uh, uh, lined up. Um, forgetting about all sorts of uh, uh, the nutritional side. So for me, it's very much about consumer, citizen. So that comes back to also what David said, people are core. We've been trusting a lot on technology breakthroughs, but we forgot about the people aspects. And I'll just echo two points. I think it's a citizen's first approach as opposed to a consumer first approach. A citizen's first approach to investing, to planning, to legislation, to policy. I think it will make a huge, huge difference. And also the concept of coherence at the national level. I find it's often easier to work at subnational level, municipal, provincial, city level, for some reason, than it is to work at national level. So I think that has to work together somehow. Um, I want to thank uh, everyone on the panel. I want to thank your questions. I hope you uh, maintain the challenging questions all day long. Keep the people on the panel. Keep them in check. Um, fact check them. And uh, a big round of applause, please, for the panel. Thank you. Thank you.